Welcome to Multivariable Calculus, Section 11.1, Vectors in Two Dimensions. And this is actually a pre-calculus topic, and, and the next section is also really pre-calculus. But we're setting up the understanding of vectors for when we do the calculus of vectors. <clears throat> vector is a Latin word meaning carrier. A Euclidean vector is a geometric entity endowed with both length and direction. In physics, Euclidean vectors are used to represent physical quantities which have both magnitude and direction, such as force, velocity, or distance, in contrast to a scalar quantity, otherwise known as real numbers, which have no direction, just magnitude. For example, we can represent the flight of an airplane with a vector, the length of which is miles per hour, and the direction shows the direction the plane is flying. Another way to use a vector is for the magnitude to be weight or force and then again the arrow to be the direction the force is applied. Here's geometric vectors. Just a, It looks like a ray. It, the difference between a vector and a ray is that a ray does not have length. The vector has a length whereas the ray continues. We usually denote the names of vectors with a letter and a little arrow on top. Um, your text denotes it just with a bold letter, but it gets a little old making bold letters all the time, so I'm going to use arrows. Now if we have two vectors, this one is B and the second one is A, if we put them um, tail to tail, then to add them we need to move one of them so that we're following the a vector and then from the end of the a vector we're following the b vector then the resultant connecting our starting point to our stopping point is called the sum of the vectors. The opposite of a vector is the same length but going in the opposite direction 180 degrees so there's negative vector b and then if we want to take a minus b basically what we do is we add negative b to a by moving it to the uh, ending of the uh, terminal point of a and then again the resultant in this case would be a minus b from the starting point to the ending point. So that's how we add and subtract vectors geometrically. The red vectors by the way again are called resultants. They are the result of adding the vectors or following one vector and then the second vector. When sketching vectors on the Cartesian plane, if the tail is on the origin, the vector is said to be in standard position. And so um, AB doubles as a point and also as a vector. But the vector is written the same way as the point where the head of the vector is, only with chevrons instead of parentheses. A and B are called the components of the vector. Now, some books don't use the chevrons. They just use parentheses which annoys me a little bit because it makes it harder to tell whether they're talking about a point or a vector. So I will use chevrons. The magnitude, or sometimes in some books called the norm of the vector, can be computed easily using the Pythagorean theorem. And the length, um, some books use the absolute value sign for length of a vector and some books use a double absolute value sign to indicate the magnitude. <clears throat> I actually prefer the double, but I think your book uses the single. A scalar is a real number. <clears throat> we have to give it a different name when we're doing vectors just because that's the way the English language is. A scalar beta times a vector is defined as beta times the vector a comma b is equal to beta a comma beta b. So you're just multiplying the components. An algebraic example, 3 times the vector 5 comma 10 is the vector 15 comma 30. A geometric example, given vector v below, sketch 3 times v. Well, it's just the same as adding v plus v plus v. So there's three v's, and so the vector that um, 3v, that represents 3v looks like the red one. A unit vector is any vector whose magnitude is one unit. There are three famous unit vectors, i, j, and k. Here's a picture of i and a picture of j. i is parallel to the x-axis, j is parallel to the y-axis. Now remember, a vector doesn't have a location, actually. You can move it around as long as you don't change its length or direction. So um, i can be drawn anywhere parallel to the x-axis and one unit long, and j can be drawn anywhere one unit long parallel to the y-axis. 
k is parallel to the z-axis, which comes out towards you. And in this lesson, we're going to be confined to two dimensions. The next lesson, we'll be doing three-dimensional ones. Any vector in 2D can be expressed as the sum of i's and j's. For example, 3 comma 4 is 3 along the x-axis and 4 up the y-axis. So if we add those two together, we get the green vector. And in chevrons, that's 3 uh, comma 4. And it's also equivalent to 3i's plus 4j's. More examples. What's this one? Well, that one would be 5i minus 1, no, minus 2j. Those, those uh, numbers are not in the right place on the y-axis. You have to look at the blocks. And this one is negative 3. Nope, I can't count, can I? negative 4i plus 7j, and this one is negative 2i minus 5j. Sorry about those numbers being off. So, we have two notations in chevrons a comma b, and in um, unit notation we have ai plus bj. Now mathematicians tend to prefer the chevrons, it's easier to write, the second way is favored by physicists. I'm not sure why that is, but we will go between the two. Sometimes we'll use one, sometimes we'll use the other. And soon, in a, uh, not the next lesson, but after that, we'll be studying 3D vector functions, which will look like this. Vector function f is um, an x function in terms of t times i plus a y function in terms of t times j plus a z function in terms of t times k. And so the vector will vary as t varies. Here's a picture of this particular vector valued function. And I'm using the book's notation. They like to use r for vector functions. And they like a bold r <clears throat> rather than an r with an arrow. So either, either notation is fine. Now the null vector, zero vector, has a length zero and no discernible direction because it's got no length. The null vector looks like a point, but he's not a point, he's a vector. Here's an example of why we need the null vector. Here we have the sum of four vectors which ends up back where you started. So basically um, the sum then is, has no length because the resultant goes from that point at the beginning of A to the point at the end of D and that's zero length. So we do need him to make our algebra vectors complete. Now vectors have many of the same properties that real numbers have. For example, the um, commutative property of addition, the associative property of addition, the distributive property of multiplication of a scalar over the sum of vectors, and the distributive property of a vector over the sum of scalars, and the associative property of scalars times a single vector. Now you'll notice that there's no multiplication of vectors here. That's because that's a little bit more complicated and we'll deal with that in the next lesson. Here's some examples from your book. Compute the vector r to s given these two points. And the, the notation here means that the vector starts at r and ends at s. Uh, we prefer to give them one letter names, but if we have two points, then we can use two points to name them. So here's a picture of the two points, and the vector then starts at R and goes towards S. And so the motion is downward 45 units, and to the right 25 units. So RS is 25 for the X or I component, and negative 45 for the Y or J component. <coughs> Now notice that we don't really need the picture because we can take the difference in the x's, subtracting the s value minus the r value, head minus tail. We get 25 that way. And then um, we can take the y values, negative 25 minus 20. Notice again it's head minus tail to get the negative 45. <clears throat> Another example, find the sum w of u plus v and illustrate it geometrically. Well, I prefer to do the geometry first because a picture's worth a thousand symbols. So there's u, 7 to the right and 5 up 
from standard position with its tail at the origin. And there's V pointing to the left 10 units, again in standard position. Now to add them, then I need to scoot one or the other. Since it's commutative, I can scoot either V or U. I decided to scoot V up there so that I'm following U and then V. And so the resultant goes from my starting point to my ending point. And so from the graph, we can read the answer. Or we can go ahead and just add them algebraically. Here we combine the I's, and there's only one J component, and so there's your answer to the left 3 and up 5 in standard position. Okay, here's another example from your book. This is multi-part. Uh, they want the norm or length of A, and so we take just the coefficients in front of I and J and square them using the Pythagorean theorem. Then they want the length of negative 2B, or norm, or magnitude. There's three different names for that. And so we take, uh, first we we double B and take the opposite of it, which doesn't really do much to the length. And then we put those numbers into the Pythagorean theorem and simplify the radical. And they want the length of A minus B. So for A minus B, we're going to take negative 1 minus 2 for the I component and negative 1 minus 2 for the J component and then throw those numbers into the Pythagorean theorem and simplify the radical again. Then they want just the sum of a plus b, and this, in this case this is going to be a vector. So we add the components, uh, negative 1 and 2 in both cases, and we get i plus j. Okay, here's another example from your book. Find two unit vectors, one in the same direction and one in the opposite direction, as a, vector a, <coughs> which uh, equals 7i minus 24j. Well, this is kind of easy. First thing we need is the, the length, norm, or magnitude. And that comes out to 25. Isn't that nice? And so that means this vector is 25 units long. So in order to make it one unit long, we have to divide by 25. And then to get one in the opposite direction that's one unit long, we just take the opposite of it. And there you go. Number 28, determine whether or not vectors A and B are perpendicular. Now later we're going to have a shortcut for this, but for now we have to do it the long way. So there's U, uh, what is that? There's A and there's B. And the question is, is that forming a right triangle? Because if they're perpendicular, then this would be a right triangle. So we'll find the length of A and we'll find the length of B and then we'll use the distance formula to find the length of the hypotenuse. So we're subtracting the x values, aka the numbers in front of the i's, and then we're subtracting the y values, aka the numbers in front of j, squaring those. And sure enough, if I square the legs and add them together, I do get the square of the hypotenuse, and therefore this is a right triangle, and therefore Yes, these vectors are perpendicular. Okay, 42. Uh, prove one of these um, properties that we alluded to earlier. And the way they want you to prove them is to go to components. So we'll just name vector A as A1, A2, and vector B as B1, B2. So then when we add them, we add them component-wise but that has to equal, according to the first statement, that has to also equal vector A, which is A1, A2. So by separating the two components, we can use properties of real numbers to show that B1 is 0, and also B2 must be 0, and hence vector B is 0, 0, which is the 0 vector, QED. Now it's your turn.